Okay, uh, good evening everyone uh, and hello everyone. <clears throat> I am Valeria Davetic, I'm a teaching assistant in the Faculty of Law, University of Belgrade. I teach Sociology of Law as, as Professor Vukovic and as, as Mila Djordjevic, my colleagues, and I also teach legal ethics. Uh, I would like to, to thank to Professor Dagita for organizing this course. I think that I'm not, uh, I won't be modest when I say that this type of course is one of a kind in our country. It, it really is. And, um, and I'm very proud that we will be host of the, the Master on Gender Equality. That I think it's a step forward, uh, not only for our university, but as well as, uh, as for Serbia as, um, a, as a state who has a lot of open issues um, uh, on, on, on gender. So, as you can see, uh, the topic of my today's presentation is gender and legal profession. So it is divided in, in four main parts. First, we will deal more about, uh, about the profession, just to understand what are the main features of every profession, why, why do we need professions, why professions are so important for a contemporary society, what is the difference between profession and occupation. <coughs> Then we will deal more on the legal profession. Uh, what are the changes and challenges that the uh, legal profession is, uh, is going through in a contemporary society, in European society, in Serbian society? Because there are a lot of social processes that are changing professions, and especially legal professions, that uh, need to strive to justice as an universal value. Uh, the third part of uh, <coughs> my presentation will be gender and legal profession. So first, I would ask you, what are the benefits of gender equality in legal profession? Why do we need that gender equality, especially in legal profession? Um, what is the feminization of legal profession? Because we talk a lot about the feminization, but I'm not sure whether people really understand what is the feminization. Is this only like a, um, uh, the overrepresentation of women in legal profession, or there are some other phenomena that are quite connected with this issue? Is it something that is a global trend, or it is something that is only uh, related with the Serbian society? And finally, we will deal more on the legal profession in Serbia. I would just uh, like a, a may, may, uh, make, um, make a small, um, a small comment on uh, law professors, on uh, lawyers, uh, and I will deal more about the judges in Serbia, because this was part of my research and part of my PhD thesis, so I think this could be quite interesting for you. So, uh, uh, oops. Uh, okay. <laughs> so this is Mike, and this is presentation. Okay, thank you. So when we have to define the, the profession, uh, so what is a profession? There are many definitions of professor professions, and as Sherry Ronch Anlu, she is an Australian sociologist, said that we can um, talk about profession and we can analyze it uh, from a two theoretical perspectives. The first one is so-called trait model or characteristic model where we su summarized and we single out the main characteristics of every profession. And this is quite common approach. So many authors like as you can see, like for example, Samuel Huntington, he outlined the, the three main characteristics of every profession. He says that the profession needs uh, something that is so-called professionalism, responsibility, and professional association. Uh, he defines profession as a specific type of functional group of people who have specialized knowledge and specialized skills, and which goal is to protect and to serve to community and to protect a common good. Uh, Brian Turner uh, sees uh, a profession and talks about the, the, the professionals, such as lawyers, doctors, judges, and so on, uh, as, uh, as legally authorized to provide highly specialized services based on professional and scientific knowledge. So, uh, finally, when we take uh, uh, this theoretical approach, when we when we uh, sing, when we are sing, uh, where, where we are uh, numbering uh, the attributes of every profession, there is also um, uh, a nice description from Talcott Parsons. He is also a sociologist. Uh, he says that the motivation is something that makes difference between, for example, a businessman and between a professional. He says that businessman is driven by an egoistic uh, model because he follows his uh, self-interest regardless to others, while on the other hand professional has an altruistic model and he serves the other members of society and to their interest. So um, he's of the opinion that, uh, that professionals are a modern and a strong force in every society that can be a successful rival to a bureaucratic organization such as the state or market. So, 
Uh, if we take another approach, for example, the other one that Sharon Roach, is men uh, that Sharon Roach mentioned, and that is a market control approach, uh, we can say that profession is not a static, uh, is not a uh, it's not a concept that we can define through attributes. It's rather a dynamic concept that we need to, um, to define as a way of organizing work. And it's a way of controlling work through monopolization of specialized knowledge, skills, um, resources, and clients. So uh, this is understandable why Emil Dirkim uh, is... Um, outlining that professionals need to have a, a system of values, specific system of values, which is embodied in a, in a code of ethics, and uh, that, uh, professionals, uh, that professionals could influence uh, on the development of a modern society. So this is um, about the profession. So just a, a couple of uh, words about the main features of every profession. As I mentioned, like uh, there are a lot of opinions on what are the main features, but I single out three. So first one is professionalism. And uh, this is very important because uh, through high and continuing education, the members of profession, they become specialized in specific area and they can carry out specific social activities which are necessary for the function of whole society. In this way, the professionals, as well as the profession, they become part of the cultural inheritance. Uh, through education, uh, their awareness of, uh, of, uh, of, of importance to develop uh, a society uh, as an entity grows and it changes. When we talk about the responsibility, it is important to, to, to just to memorize and to be aware that professionals have specific knowledge, specific skills, and um, uh, they, uh, they use these specific skills and knowledge to provide services in different uh, fields of society, such as education, health, uh, science, law, so on. So if you think a little bit broadly, you will understand that in, um, in some way, the clients of every professional is society in some way. And finally, uh, we have to be aware that, uh, that professionals uh, belong to a group, to a specific association. You can take uh, any profession, for example, is it a lawyers, um, a judges, or a doctors? They have their community, they have their uh, association. Um, uh, the, the main role of association is not only the monopolization of knowledge, but also they issue license for work, and they also uh, make and they are developing the sense of unity. Uh, so the professionals see themselves as a specific group in relation to lay people or, or to the members of others' profession. Also, it is very important that professions, uh, that professionals uh, are um, defending the professions between themselves to be aware when some other professionals are, uh, are not respecting the values and uh, the rules that have been um, uh, implemented before. So this is just a little bit uh, about the profession. And just shortly, just to make the dif difference between profession and occupation. Uh, there is a lot of opinions in literature. You, you will see that um, some authors do not make any difference. They use these words as a synonymous. Uh, but there, there is a difference in a way that maybe you can see more on, 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 this, on this chart. For example, um, I can say that I, I finished law school, I have a degree in law, I graduated here, and I teach uh, sociology of law, and I'm a professor. Um, in this way, I could say that my profession and my occupation are the same. But for example, if one day I decided to go on a long trip on a seaside and uh, to, do some, to work as a waitress uh, or in Greece, I could say that my profession is uh, a lawyer, I finished the law, but my occup occupation currently is waitress. But uh, what is the, 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 the basic difference? Uh, the main difference is that um, for, uh, to become a part of any profession, we need like a, a long formal education at the university or any other institution um, uh, that, that provides special knowledge and that has a state license for work. Also, uh, being a professional, this requires a, a, a level of creativity. Um, uh, I need a code of ethics. I need uh, the system of values. Um, uh, professionals are also autonomous in performing their, their work. Um, uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, quick one. Uh, 
How do we translate it on Serbian? Aha, profesija i zanimanje. I zanat. To su neka tri različita. Znači, šta je moje zanimanje, šta je moja profesija, šta sam ja po vokaciji. Po profesiji i po vokaciji sam pravnica i to se poklopa s mojim zanimanjem u ovom trenutku, a jednog dana to ne mora da se poklope ako odlučim da se nečim drugim bavim. Ovde je samo da podignemo nivo toga zašto se razlikuju oni koji su visoko obrazovni, oni koji završavaju fakultete i kako su oni važni da održe društvo. Gde je taj odnos tu između države i tržišta? Zapravo profesije su te koji održavaju taj prostor između države i tržišta u okviru tog građanskog društva, kao nosioci i pokretači nekih promjena. Je li ok? Da, evo. Uh, yeah, so uh, now I explained it. <laughs> so yeah, maybe we can skip it. So basically like professionals are not only motivated with the financial reward, it's also like an uh, idealistic motive. We have like, a, uh, we serve to ideals, to, to values. You know, it's not, it's not only a salary, it's more than that. So uh, yeah, I mean, it should be like that, <laughs> yes. So uh, what are the legal professions? So we're a little bit closer to our subject. So when we talk, Uh, yes, of course. Yes. I think that in this defining, we should also include differentiation. So there, are all we cannot say that, normatively speaking, all of these positive uh, dimensions should be part of intellectual professional person. But there are differences. Some really include also ethical approach into their professional uh, profile and the others no, not. So, and the matter of responsibility, responsibility, for example, for societal values, for political orientations, for different things. So they're a little bit more, less generalization and a little bit more differentiation from the point of value orientations, I think that would be good to, to be included. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you, Professor Dragica. Uh, maybe now when we talk more about legal profession, we can uh, like, uh, yes. yes, yeah. Okay, so this was like overall about the, the professions, and now what about the legal profession? So, uh, I mean, as, as any other theoretical concepts in sociology, uh, also the concept of legal profession could be analyzed from different theoretical perspectives. So we have like uh, Matthew de Flam, uh, he's, um, he's dealing with the sociology of law, um, an author, and he says that the legal profession is a set of professional roles, such as judges, lawyers, prosecutors, legal advisors, law professors, and so on, who are focused on maintaining a legal system, which is important to all members of society who are also the legal subjects. In other words, he sees that there is like a, uh, a one, uh, one legal profession. He's not making like a, uh, differences between uh, like the, the different professional rules. But on the other hand, we have another author, also sociologist, Kitty Kalavita. She's dealing a lot with, uh, with the lawyers in uh, common law system, ex especially in American society. And uh, she, uh, she's aware that the differences between, um, uh, between, uh, like, um, uh, between law firms who, who is working for uh, big corporations and whose clients are very powerful uh, on the market and they are mainly dealing with the commercial law uh, are, are, I mean, their, their, their salaries, their social position, uh, their um, prestige, um, um, everything uh, is quite different from the lawyers who are dealing with an individual clients, with the, with the regular lay member, lay people. So uh, the differences are quite obvious. This is the reason why she says that uh, we can say that there are more legal professions than one. Even when we talk about lawyers, we can say that uh, their role and social role, professional roles are quite different. So finally, uh, when we talk about, uh, uh, I mean, like the, the specific um, uh, social context, like in Serbia, we use the term pravnik to define the person who graduated uh, in the faculty of law, who, who acquired legal education and specific qualification to engage in a specific legal profession. This person uh, also, uh, uh, needs to be qualified and take other qualification in, in the court, law office, prosecutor office, and so on. So these are the things uh, why uh, we use the term uh, uh, pravnik, just uh, uh, for an overall uh, to, to address the, the, the different, to address like 
someone who finished faculty of law, but, but we make difference between legal professions. So we make uh, like more differences than the other authors. So uh, legal profession as, as, um, as, uh, as other profession is going through different, uh, different changes. We can say that contemporary world is, is changing uh, every day, that uh, we are facing these changes and we are feeling these changes uh, in, in every part of our life. So I just pointed out like the three main uh, processes, and the first one is globalization, spe specifically economic globalization. Uh, we, global we define globalization as a process uh, of uh, economic, political, and cultural interchange and interdependence uh, between, um, between people, between um, uh, states uh, in every sphere of life uh, from, from criminal to health to law to science and so on. Uh, there isn't any part of our life that uh, hasn't been touched by economic globalization. Uh, why? Because the free movement movement of capital, goods, services, um, the technological development, as well as growing significance on the information influenced on the economic integration. So um, uh, local, regional, and national economies are linked uh, all across the world, and they are uh, representing one global economy. So this also influenced on the labor market of lawyers and labor market uh, of legal profession that I will be talking uh, more about later. Uh, the two uh, second and the second and the third process are quite connected. It's like the neoliberalism and capitalism, which are quite um, connected in a way that um, uh, they represent an ideology. Uh, and uh, when we talk about the neoliberalism, we can say that um, this ideology shifts um, uh, the economic control from the state to private sector, and as uh, Professor previously stated welfare economy was more oriented to gender, and now when we talk about neoliberalism and capitalism, uh, we can uh, problematic this issue more than before. So. Uh, what I would like to say about these three processes is that the process of economic globalization and neoliberal ideology uh, in most parts of the world, as well as in European countries, they question the monopoly of expertise as one of the basic components of the legal profession. The increased number of law faculties that are competitors on the labor market resulted in an increased number of lawyers. This transition of higher education to the labor market places the quality of education on the second place, while the eligibility of workers for the market is highlighted in the first place. Transformation of the legal education, profit rates, and the consequences of endangering universities as institutions responsible for the education of future lawyers can be seen not only in European countries, but in the whole world. But I will deal more about later. So finally, we are coming to uh, the part that we will talk more about today is the, the challenges and the changes of the legal profession in the contemporary science society. So I single out uh, only six that, uh, in the opinion of Sharon Chanlo, and I share her opinion, are maybe like the most obvious and most important, but they're quite interlinked with the others. So today we are only dealing with the second one, that the proportion of women lawyers grows every day. Um, and we will talk more about the representation of women in legal profession. But also we have to be aware that the number of lawyers um, increased, that the lawyers are, often, uh, are more often employed by large law firms or bureaucratic organizations, that technological progress influenced on some dimensions of legal work, so they are now more routinized and de-skilled de than they had ever been before. Uh, professional control is weakening in some aspect, and this is very important because when we talk about profession, we talk about the monopoly of expertise that I mentioned before. And more than ever, the legal profession has drawn the media attention. So uh, the number of lawyers uh, increased. As I already mentioned, we have something that is called uh, the expansion of the higher legal education institution. I wrote a paper on this issue, and uh, uh, one <laughs> one say was always on my mind that this uh, this was a say from an from a foreign author. He says that uh, uh, I would say in Serbian, but we can translate it. Uh, Studenata pravnog fakulteta ima onoliko koliko ima kobasica u svim mesara. 
uh, he wanted to say that there is a lot of uh, 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 legal, uh, a lot of uh, that the, the increasing number of faculties of law and the number of um, graduated students from the law faculty uh, is something that really changed the labor market. For example, uh, I wrote a paper that in Serbia, maybe you didn't know about this, but for me it was quite interesting that. Um, Every uh, uh, every eighth place on the labor market every year is reserved for the student of faculty of law. If we take into consideration the state faculties of law as well as the private one, so as you can see, when we when we talk about the all different aspects of of science of faculties of universities, every eighth place on the labor market is for the um, uh, is is reserved for the students of faculty of law. So this uh, is something that really needs to to draw our attention to think more um, about about the education that we are giving, uh, for example, I mean, this was something that we are really thinking about and we uh, we are thinking more about the transversal skills and we are trying to, to give our students more, not only the positive law, because we are of the opinion that um, students need to be taught. Um, mm -hmm. So is it, uh, Ali, um, on the other hand, uh, I guess uh, for uh, bachelors, there is a wide uh, spectrum of uh, professions as uh, uh, graduated uh, lawyers uh, to, to choose on, um, on uh, labor market. Uh, are we talking just about uh, legal professions or any, any other uh, professions connected with, with law? law? So one more time, your question is when, when this uh, law student is on the market after bachelor of studies, can you just repeat? So, what uh, are we talking just about uh, natural uh, uh, course of uh, their? I mean, uh, are we talking just about uh, legal professions when they finish their? Uh... Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what is an issue? Because uh, when you have so many students coming from faculties of law, uh, the labor market cannot. Uh, I mean, there is not enough places for them in the traditional legal profession. So, for example, I think that this is your question. So, yeah, th this is a problem because, for example, in, in courts, uh, maybe professor wants to add something. Ah, okay. 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 Yeah, it's okay. Um, so, for example, you have a... Um, uh, um, we have, we have uh, limited. A, you have limited number uh, of uh, law graduates who, who can be um, accepted, for example, to be part of the court. You have limited number to be part of the faculties of law, um, uh, to be in other, le for example, maybe only the lawyers, there isn't any um, like limitation formal limitation, but now there is a lot of non-formal and informal limitation. So this is a, a problem because the expansion of legal, uh, uh, of, of law institutions and uh, faculties of law and the, the number of law students who are increasing, uh, they cannot take part in traditional um, uh, legal professions. So this is just something that, that is, is going on and that we as institution have to think about more just to educate our students uh, on, on other on other Transversal skills and, and competences because they are not only skilled for um, a classical legal profession. Yeah. Okay, so um, if I got it right, uh, uh, the complexity of modern capitalism, the new functions in the society, uh, in our case, the liberalization, transformation from socialism to capitalism, and development of the economy have all contributed on one hand to a more demand for lawyers and therefore there are more law, law graduates, right? On the other hand, there is a strong push in modern societies to have more highly educated people. And previously, the work that has been done by clerks with high schools is now done by lawyers. For instance, in human resources here in the faculty. Forty years ago, that would be done by a high school graduate, now a lawyer. And this is, if I'm getting right, these are the social processes that lead to a more demand for legal students and more higher enrollment rates. And so I'm just trying to, you know, speed up and uh, ask you to get 
closer to the issue of gender within the legal profession. And, and if more people enroll, more women will enroll, combined with the emancipation. So, no. Okay. Yes, I will speed up. Yeah, but um, yes, thank you. Uh, this is not an always issue. I will talk more about because uh, this assumption, for example, today uh, legal professions uh, legal professions can change a lot because um, historically analyzed, uh, a legal profession were predominantly male, uh, but um, today, like a half of law graduates are female, we have that representation of women, but the assumption that if there is a uh, half women uh, uh, law graduate students, that there will be half of them in legal profession is not always correct as well. Uh, that is not correct that uh, the assumption that if there is a, um, a half women in legal profession, that half of them will be in the, in the hierarchical position. So this is something, okay, so then I will skip a lot because I just thought I have more time. So, okay, the proportion of women, women lawyers grows every day. Uh, so this is something that I, that I already mentioned that like the proportion of women and representation of women is, is growing every day. Uh, but um, professions are now more open to women, but there are a lot of barriers and many difficulties that our women are still confronted with. And one of my team for discussion is the barriers uh, for women to entering into profession. I outlined a couple of them, but I would like to hear more from you. So uh, women are more likely to experience sexual harassment. Some of the employers do not encourage maternity leave. There is a something so-called maternity wall. Women will more frequently have less paid jobs. Uh, Mila already stated that. Women are usually paid less for the ch same job, so on. And something which, what is very interesting that I also prepared for discussion is that Professor already stated before is that um, uh, there is a culture, so-called uh, think leader, think male, and um, this is the, the question of leadership because uh, uh, male leadership is not the only way uh, to being lead uh, some type of organization. Uh, because there is also something that is so-called female leadership. There is different type of leadership. There is something so-called human leadership. So I will skip the other uh, changes can of... I, can I also... So, yes, sure. Just uh, uh, bring you back to very good two questions with which you started. Uh -huh. So you, you put the question why gender equality education or... Uh, awareness raising is important for uh, legal professions and legal education. Very important question. And another one was a bit different uh, uh, concerning the fem feminization of professions and feminization of, for example, legal professions. That speaks more about sociological, empirical, and then uh, uh, explaining of that as feminization always means un, uh, uh, loosening the value, so it has that negative context. So, but I think it, the first what you asked and what can be interesting for students to take part in discussing and that you explain this importance of. Uh, gender perspective and gender sensitization of legal education. When we started the project, Logem project, there was the explanation that uh, gender sensitization or getting, uh, achieving the gender competent uh, knowledge and legal education is important because lawyers, judges, public administrators, decision makers in the parliaments, many of them are lawyers. And then it really, is, and so it's very important for all uh, dimensions of the society to have different, how these revised and deconstructed and reconstructed from gender perspective knowledge among. So that was with which we started, but it, it can be articulated and enriched and developed much more and better. So maybe you and the others would. Yes, uh, sure. If, if, thank you, thank you, Professor. Is there any uh, comments maybe on this? Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, so uh, uh, when we talk about gender and legal profession, uh, it's like uh, an overall. As I already m mentioned, uh, it's like um, historically seen, a legal profession was predominantly a, a male career path. 
And um, uh, today, uh, in a contemporary world, uh, women comprise more than a half of law school graduates in many jurisdictions. But however, uh, if there is more than a half a woman as law graduate, this doesn't mean that there will be more than a half in legal profession. And of course, this is quite obvious when we talk about the hierarchical position. So uh, historically overview, we can say that women started uh, entering in the legal profession quite late. Uh, although most of the European uh, constitutions, uh, even in the 19th century, guaranteed equality, these professions were not pertained to women. Reasons were many, really. It's like um, systematical prohibition of civil rights, legal subordination to fathers and husbands, uh, no access to higher education, as, as Professor pointed out. It, it was very, very, uh, very important. A prohibition to engage in certain professions due to perceived gender features that endanger prestige, status, and income, and so on. So as you can see these were the beliefs, these were the values that um, uh, entering um that, uh, that the, the, the representation of women in different legal profession will lower the status and the prestige of these professions. And this is something that is very connected with the process of feminization that we will talk more about today. So uh, uh, what was the way to enter into legal profession? The legal education uh, started opening for women in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century. The number of female students uh, slowly increased ant until the 1970s and uh, this number started to rise more and more. So in the, uh, in the 1990s, the, the gender structure was totally changed because from the dominantly male profession, uh, the legal professions were highly female professions. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, something that is interesting for you to know that today's situation, uh, as European research shows, and in, in most of the European countries, I will show you the chart um, uh, later, uh, we can say that um, uh, when we talk about judges, uh, the position of judges are, are fairly distributed between women and, um, and men, but uh, women uh, are, uh, are, are slightly uh, in a majority for today when we talk about the judges in EU countries. Uh, when we talk about common law countries, uh, the curve is in, in favor of men because 60% uh, of judges in common law countries are men. And um, the reasons for this is something uh, that is, is a barrier that we, we will uh, try to, 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 to map. Why? Because um, this is something that Professor already mentioned. Uh, 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 women uh, are a lack of uh, mentoring and the uh, supportive networks because most of these supportive networks and most of these mentors uh, are on the on the higher positions and they usually men so in the common law systems uh, uh, judges are, are are usually men and uh, the the whole process of promotion and election of, of new judges are not so transparent and the criteria are not so clear and obvious and this is not only problem in a common uh, law uh, systems but also in a civil law. Mm -hmm. uh, just in that topic, uh, mm -hmm. uh, when we an analyze uh, st statistics and data and we see a disbalance in the numbers of judges, uh, male, female, uh, are uh, gender equality actions always necessary? Uh, meaning uh, it just might be a, a, a stuff, of, a, a preference. Meaning... Uh, uh, women enjoy that type of uh, flexible working mm -hmm. hours but, and uh, men enjoy other type, uh, meaning uh, is always a 50-50 qu quota in every type of profession necessary or it's just a, a thing of uh, preferences? Yeah, this was my question to you. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yes, I wanted to ask you. I mean, uh, when we talk about, like, you see, it's like, First, just to explain the, 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 the process of feminization. So what is uh, 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 feminization? It's, it's defined as a process or phenomenon uh, where we talk about the prevalence of women uh, in a certain profession. But feminization is not only the increasing number of women, over-representation of women, it's also connected with deprofessionalization, with the reduction or a loss of reputation of the, of, of the profession, lower salaries of member of specific profession in comparison to the similar one. Women are still entering in this profession. And although there is more women than men, women are uh, not so often on the hierarchical position. So my question to you is, uh, 
uh, why do we need uh, this equality? Why do, I mean, do we really need to be 50-50? Uh, why these processes are happening? I mean, and what is your opinion? I mean, I, I have, like, this is an answer. This is my opinion. What are the benefits of gender equality? I'm not sure whether and in, the, in which way we can just manage that in every single moment we have 50-50. I think that this is quite difficult and that this is uh, uh, very connected with the wider uh, social processes. But what is your opinion on, on this issue? Uh, in, order, in order to make a com compromise, Maybe we should need uh, a, qu a gender quota, but on a uh, bit uh, lower bar, m uh, lower minimum level, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. when do you think that the gender quota could be like positive discrimination? Uh, maybe professor to put, yeah, 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 students and then professors, okay, yes. Uh, so gender quota is, uh, is I'm okay with that, it's positive discrimination, it's good, but um, it is not stated when you have this gender quota on which positions are women placed. For example, we have in the Ministry of Interior this gender quota that women should be also represented, etc. But we see it in these uh, administrative uh, jobs. So we have, for example, uh, it's uh, like maybe more women in the police, like 50 something percent, but they're on the lower, lower positions. So it's uh, also good to include gender quota, but also put it in these managerial positions, which is also difficult because women also do not have time to uh, do this kind of jobs to stay up late to work like uh, shifts uh, night shifts and stuff because of the other unpaid work that they are doing at home uh, yes yes and also uh, we have to think in both uh, and watch in both directions so let's say uh, strict uh, okay 30 percent uh, women and also let's say uh, bar quota and also let's say for men 30 percent bar quota so, uh, no, 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 I'm just yeah, talking. It's an interesting point because yeah. it's an interesting point because you're saying we don't want over representation of either men or women in a certain profession, right? Yeah. But <clears throat> apart from quotas, <clears throat> as you rightly pointed out, some social structures also work in favor of or against feminization of profession. As you rightly said, um, li uh, work family balance <coughs> is easily more easily achieved if you're a judge in Serbia than if you're a lawyer, like advocate. Obviously. Then some contingencies occur. Uh, one of the large one of the large one of the factors that contributed to the shifting of the gender balance in legal professions in Serbia were nineties when a lot, a lot of men actually left the position of judges pursuing a more lucrative career as lawyers. I mean, simply as that. And they were better paid. And the 90s were, I mean, you don't remember 90s. It was difficult to live in the 90s. I mean, basic, basically, you couldn't you know, earn enough money to, 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 to you know, feed your family or whatever. And then there are historical conditions and historical structures, ideological and historical structures. United States reached the gender balance uh, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, law students uh, uh, like 10 years ago, the one that we had like 30 years ago. So we were in that sense at least two decades in front of the USA, roughly speaking. Why? Because we had socialism. Socialism was a super emancipatory power in, 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 our, in our country. And actually what socialism brought us is a giant leap from the 45, as you know more than I do, which was uh, in 45, 1945, we had an agrarian society, a small share of urban population, a small share of highly educated, and in just a few decades, we had, you know, tumbled up the, the, the whole society. So, when we speak about feminizations of a profession, it's, it's about quota, but it's also about the structures, other social structures that, that shape the way that professions evolve. Just, that was just my question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, I think Mila wanted to add something as well. 
Uh, yeah, I'm following uh, Daniela. Uh, when I'm thinking of feminization of legal profession, I think that we, we cannot have like one measure fits all. So if we're going with the judges and uh, quotas, for example, for the barristers or lawyers, it would be much better to go with, um, I don't know, making some arrangements for while a woman is on the uh, sick leave uh, to have someone to leave the law office, for example. So and and even when you think how you can make um, quotas in private companies, so like the main issues for female lawyers in Serbia, I think, is the question: what to do when you ca cannot work? Like to whom no. to leave the the clients and the job? So and it's quite different problem than the judges' problem of female judges. So. We can have. Uh, we should go for with the different options. In my opinion, yeah, uh, definitely, definitely. I think that someone else uh, uh, is no, no one. The, I saw something in chat. No, no, I saw it was a question from Tiana. I wanted to. A lot is in the area. Uh -huh. How many? So, how many private legal education institutions are in Serbia? If I remember correctly, uh, I think that the overall number was uh, something like. Um, uh, 12, uh, but I'm not sure. I have to check. I just remember the number of, uh, of law graduates who are going on the labor market. This was quite interesting for me. Uh, I, can, I can send you my paper to, to, to see more on this. And from uh, Sheri Bakimrak, as law uh, is an area that shapes society in general and has almost the last word, uh, it is particularly uh, important that this area should hold 50-50. Of course, it is symbolically important to have this percentage in other fields too, even if that's impossible. Yes, uh, this is something that is um, uh, 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 interconnected with the thing that we are talking right now. So thank you for your comments and thank you for listening. So uh, just uh, to, to, to finish what I, I have started, when we talk about the, uh, the EU countries, we can say that uh, when we talk, for example, about uh, the judges, um, and this, you will see that this is something that is global trend, that's something that um, uh, is quite illustrative more or less for Serbia. So uh, that uh, female judges are, um, I mean, fairly distributed, what, uh, the judges are fairly distributed between women and male, uh, but uh, women be, are being slightly in the majority when we talk about judges in the EU. And also we have um, overrepresentation of women, but in the courts of first instances. So this is something that is also um, Yes, similar in Serbia. And uh, on the other hand, uh, men, uh, ma male judges, they are overrepresented in the hierarchical uh, positions, uh, in the courts of multiple jurisdictions, and also in the Supreme Court. But when we talk about Serbia, in our Supreme Court, the situation is quite different because we have uh, uh, 31 women and nine men. And this was on the day of my research ended. This was like a couple of months ago. And the president, on the Supreme Court in that moment was a female. So in Serbia, the situation regarding the Supreme Court is quite different than in the other EU countries. And also, something that is uh, similar in all EU countries as well in Serbia is that uh, the, the female um, non-judicial staff are overrepresented, and the, the quota is uh, one to three. So on every three non-judicial staff, it, it goes only one man, uh -huh. and they are and they are less paid as well. Okay. One, one question: mm -hmm. What drives this this gender this distribution? Why is uh, why is uh, Serbia different than USA or or EU in that sense of having more female judges, especially? Higher courts. In the higher courts, okay. Yes, uh, I will. I will come to that. Uh, just to. Okay. So, um, uh, your question is why we have more women. 
So uh, we have more women in the Supreme Court. This is the, the difference. But when we talk about uh, women uh, in the hierarchical position, this situation uh, is, um, uh, is not different. In which way? This is a catch that I wanted to show you. This is from my PhD. Uh, as you can see, like um, this is the, the chart that I made, and this is something that refers only to the judges in the courts of general jurisdiction in Serbia. As you can see, we have like uh, almost 200 of judges in Serbia. Uh, I will stand because I also don't like to sit while I, <laughs> I did. So um, as you can see, like the proportion of women and uh, uh, of women and men, in the courts of appeal, higher courts, magistrate courts, uh, it's quite obvious. And when we, I mean, when you see like the, the, the total number, you could say more or less that the proportion is uh, three one. On every three female judges, there is a one male judge. But where is the catch? Why we can say that? Okay, we can say that there is a feminization of this profession when we talk about judges in Serbia, and this is quite uh, interconnected with the other processes that Professor already mentioned. And it, uh -huh. just to add, so Valeria, and uh, please, you have to turn off. So and. Uh, the situation with Serbian Supreme Court, what does it, what does it tell us? Is there also some kind of feminization or something completely different makes this difference between our su Supreme Court and yeah, those in the My EU. question is, what does, so it's the other way around, what this feminization of Serbian courts tells us about Serbian courts? So, the Supreme Court is, yes, in our that is my case is, that's, of course, the, the question per se relevant. But this also is to be explained with, with something. With something, yes. But uh, I just wanted to point this before we, we touch the Supreme Court, because this is a Supreme Court is different. But when you talk about the courts, like the hierarchical positions, you see, like this is also the courts of general jurisdiction. And when we talk about men uh, who are presidents of the court, there is like 46 men and 49 women. But this is not a equally represented. Why? I mean, I call this like, uh, maybe professor has another uh, term, like uh, illusory equality, apparent, uh, apparent equality. Because if we say... Illusion of equality. Yes, illusion of equality. Because you see here, the proportion is 3-1. And here, the proportion is 1-1. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And then the, here, the proportion is... To repeat. Uh -huh. Okay, yes, I will repeat. So as you can see here, the proportion is 3-1. And we can say there is a feminization. When we, when, we, when we talk about the overall population. But when we talk about the presidents of the court, you, if, we, if you just see this chart, and if you don't see the broader picture, you could say, no, there is an equality. But how, how is there an equality if, if there is more women uh, being judged, but the presidents are, are equal? This is something that was quite interesting for me. This is something that was in my PhD thesis. I mean, this was not the topic of my thesis. This was something that I just found out, and it, was, and, and it can open more questions. And just. Just uh, something even more interesting is when you talk about the court of an appeal, we have four courts of appeal. Uh, during my research, all presidents of the courts of an appeal were men. In the end of my research, and that was uh, in uh, June, in, in, uh, in, in, in June last year, one, one female uh, president was appointed on the court of the appeal. So, you see, we are like a, a paradoxical country. And then you have a Supreme Court, which is dominantly by, by female in the moment when I finished research. So, yeah, yes. Okay. So if we were to look for the systematic solution, we would claim that the feminization of the professions takes place. But apparently, uh, it's not uh, the feminization of the hierarchy of the profession, right? The highest positions. And basically, <clears throat> it goes well, with what we know about the professions is that there is an internal stratification of the profession. So the, the higher uh, layers <clears throat> of the profession often perform non-repetitive, more uh, uh, demanding, professionally or intellectually demanding tasks that come with higher salaries and more prestige, right? And yes. then there are lower parts of the profession. Yes. So it would be interesting to see whether 
whether there is some sort of interaction between the feminization or the gender stratification with other parts of the strat or, or segments of the stratification of the profession. Okay, but I guess we don't have data for that. No, uh, unfortunately, yes, the topic of my, of my PhD was something else. This was something that I find out, but I think that this could be, I mean, uh, more, more, uh, this could be uh, uh, more investigated because uh, uh, as I, I mean, this is like some, my impressions from the field. Uh, there are courts, I mean, for example, in some courts, there, there is only one male judge. And it, it was quite interesting because you were sitting and having like a focus group discussion with, with uh, 12 women judges and only one man. And uh, in one moment I asked, maybe we can invite uh, more uh, judges, male, and they said, but this is the only one, we don't have it. And, um, and there is a lot of courts uh, who are organized in this way. So uh, when um, I talked to them, it was like informal conversations. Um, how do they feel? Is there any differences? They, they just don't feel these uh, pressures. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in Serbian judiciary, being a president of the court is not just a managerial position. It's the point where the political control of the judiciary takes mm -hmm. place. That is what we know actually from various empirical researches. If somebody is to put a political pressure on a judge to perform a certain function or to do whatever he or she wants to do or should do, then it is the, the president of the court who will, who will be a transmitter or the source of the pressure. So in that sense, I mean, uh, this actually means it's not just that, uh, you know, there is an, an uh, equal distribution of when men and women, but it might also mean that in a predominantly female profession, men control the profession, but also politically control or have a large share of in the political control the of the of, over the profession itself and the judiciary. Yes, I, I agree with you, Professor, and that's why I just call it like in, in, in illustrary equality, like apparent equality, because th this is not a real equality. Because if you see like the, the overall uh, and the total number of judges, something is, is wrong. So uh, are we facing, uh, um, the, sorry, are we facing uh, like um, a glass ceiling? Is this also something that exists in Serbia? It's like in a, in a judicial professor, in a judicial professor profession, or, or we are not facing it. So uh, this is just uh, a, a case study that I wanted to to uh, to show you. Uh, something that is quite interesting and also maybe important for you is just to see maybe numbers from other countries to see where is Serbia, because as uh, previously professor stated, um, like um, uh, in in southeastern Europe and uh, especially after the Second World War, the influence of communist and sociologists and um, socialist ideology uh, in terms of gender equalities was of really great importance. It is changed and empowered women to become part of legal profession. And as you can see, for example, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Poland, Portugal, Estonia, you see when women uh, started to be part of the faculties of law, uh, when they uh, the first women graduated, um, when they become lawyers, judges, legal academics, and all of this uh, is quite late. You see, we are talking about, I don't know, in the end of the 19th century, the beginning, the beginning of the 20th century. And this is something that is the advantage of these countries that had this communist and socialist past, because um, we did promote gender equality, especially during the, um, the special, I mean, in, in during the Second World War and the other uh, civil wars, women had a, a very great uh, and important role. So that's why we have uh, that difference than, than, than other countries um, have. Uh -huh. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. You actually, you actually answered. You actually, your question is probably the key question. Uh, what happens to the court when it's 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 a feminine court, right? Um, well, um, I'm not sure whether we have data for Serbia or uh, I mean, and that's not that's not the field of of, of sociology of law or legal uh, theory that I. Uh, 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 no, but um, I'm going to give just an illustration. I think it was 17, 18 years ago that I did a fieldwork survey with judges in Bosnia. And it was about domestic violence. And one judge, a male judge, says, come on. And I'm trying to 
quote, come on. I mean, a slap is not a violence. A snap is a pedagogy. Mm. It's a call. But kaj je šamer? Nasilje, šamer je pedagogija, brat. That, that is a quote from the interview. So, in that sense, I mean, uh, I assume, and this is only the assumption, that uh, uh, having a feminine or a fem fem feminized profession, legal profession, might implicate a higher degree, let's say, of a legal protection of women in a society. Um, uh, a stronger um, uh, accountability of various actors from business and private life in, in terms of, you know, gender equality, anti-discrimination, etc., etc. But as far as I know, we don't have data confirming or, or, or... Well, in that sense, it would be interesting to go through, like, uh, the, uh, ju uh, the decisions on the domestic violence and everything in the survey that were conducted, and that should be data gender segregated according to the judges who were passing final judgments. That's one issue. For instance, I'm now interested in this case that we have, huge case on Mika Aleksic, who is the judge? Is the female or male? That's my question. Yet another uh, another question is uh, when you, Professor, mentioned this uh, political pressure. I'm curious. Uh, with this like culture that we have, like gender regime in our country, so layers of psychology, sociology, and everything is generally, how should they say, easier to make pressure on female judges, to intimidate them, to make it, I mean, these are, you know, far-fetching and we cannot ever make, yeah, we, Oh, but uh, according to what Danila was talking about, the president, yeah. they, as the male dominant uh, power uh, capturing persons, they're closer to, if we are speaking about dependent judiciary, not independent as it should be, then yeah. they, so male, yeah. male judges but, but who also, concentrate power, they are those to to be, how to say, closer to the po political field, political nomenclature, and reliable, uh, liable to their uh, influence. But, I mean, gender regimes need not be consistent or coherent. Of course. At least in Serbia, you have one gender regime in the realm of family, which is more... And you find more patriarchal values and patterns in the family life than you would find in the public life. That's, I, I think that's socialism. And, and, and as, as you see from this example, uh, gender, uh, gender regimes are in a sort of, as Dagica emphasized in our conversation, in a sort of dialectics. You have forces, emancipatory, emancipatory forces, conservative forces, and, and they struggle in between. And so, in that sense, I mean, in that sense, I forgot my point. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay because it's nine o'clock. I mean, it's yeah, also yeah, no. we're talking. <laughs> and I just, uh, if, if may I add, like professor, as, as Professor said, like there are a lot of benefits uh, like to have gender equality in legal profession because in this way we promote like a fairness, uh, we, uh, we enhance democratic le legitimacy. Women have like specific experience such as maternity, yeah. such as pregnancy, birth, and they can understand more. But uh, I would like to mention maybe some study that could be interesting for you regarding the, the family cases. There has been like a empirical research in, in France in one court. Um, it was a family court and um, they they, tr they were trying to map two, uh, two things. The first one is uh, uh, whether male or female judges are, um, uh, are appointing more to being judges in, in family courts uh, and what are their reasons for that and the second is there any differences in their verdicts so this is something that you're interesting uh, and um uh, they, what did they found out? The first, like um, uh, they are, um, they are appointing more or less in, um, in in the same number. There is, they're, they're free, um, fairly represented, but the reasons were different. Uh, for for male judges, this was just um, one step uh, to the top, 
they wanted more. Uh, and uh, women uh, wanted to be part of the family court is because they have um, emotional uh, reasons. They are um, involving more than uh, male judges. They don't see this like a, like a temporary job. It's like a li lifetime career. And when we talk about the verdicts, there wasn't any differences. But uh, we have to, uh, to, be, uh, to take into consideration uh, that this research was, um, was done by sociologists and lawyers as well. So uh, in, in which way they really take into consideration the normative part, the sociological part, but they didn't find any differences. So this is something that could be uh, uh, like, uh, uh, investigated more and, and it is interesting. So there are a lot of open, open questions. So uh, I don't know if I have time for more slides or maybe just to open discussion because I, I really prepared like a very interesting discussion. Yeah, I just prepared like a couple of uh, things that I would like to, uh, to mention. Um, so sorry. Thank you for your attention. And yeah, so um, I just wanted to share with you what are the barriers to achieve gender equality. So uh, what do you think what our uh, women are facing with or men are facing with and how we can, we can make this uh, 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 to achieve better in legal profession? Well, the, the first part. So what are the barriers? Maybe we could just uh, uh, single out, point them out, and then just a little bit talk. I, I've singled out a couple of them here, but maybe we can start with you, so. Mm -hmm. Barriers? Yes. As a mother. I can say um, textbooks, elementary school textbooks. Uh -huh. Yeah. I had issues with the first grade Serbian textbook, with the songs that are inside that. Uh -huh. So. The father is presented as a lion, you know, he's fighting for his family and everything, and mommy is in the kitchen preparing dinner for their kids. So, yeah, so that's the first thing. And inside my family, I have personally fought battles precisely on that topic. And then my son goes and reads this song. So that was the first trigger I had. Second is social environment. Whatever I do in my house, in my family, the values I promote, I constantly need to reteach my children, constantly, because the pressure is great. In the school, school is a bit, I mean, they have lines and limits, but in the sports, it's horrific. Uh, the discrimination is open, the constant, uh, I should say, uh, uh, the constant um, reiteration of stereotypes is present overwhelmingly everywhere among the parents, from the hierarchical structures in the club, uh, the kids can, uh, the, the girls and the boys can together play that sport, but there were like directives from the very head of the club that uh, they want to forbid girls into that sport. So a lot of things are happening really openly. And while we're living, uh, me, myself, in my own bubble, being mother and faced with educational system, sports system and everything, uh, I constantly need to have my own personal struggles on every day. Uh, in everyday life, yeah. Can I add something? Uh -huh. I am a father of an almost 16-year-old son. He has two meters. He's two meters high. He's a sportsman, pretty handsome, like some of his family. <laughs> and uh, he's a victim of, he was a victim of, uh, yeah. he and a friend of his. In the, in the high school, one of the best rated high schools around here. And he came to me and he said, listen, I mean, I know what to do when boys harass me, but I honestly don't know what to do when 12 girls from the cl my class harass me. It was an eight months of horror in our family. And... Uh, <clears throat> He was harassed by the group of 12 girls from, from his class. And one of the guys, one of the boys who was in his situation, he left and he was like, I'm gonna 
make things right. And this is the battle I'm going to win. It's going to be hard, but I'm going to win. And he, he is close to winning. Uh, gender equality, speaking about kids, I mean, we diverge from the legal profession, but gender equality has actually brought, in my opinion, new patterns of behavior, particularly among younger population. As I said, younger population tend to be, particularly young women, girls, tend to be more emancipated and have embraced uh, a sort of women power worldview, right? In which women are completely equal with men, have a sexual life which is equal with the sexual life of men, or emotional life. It's all the same for them. And that has actually resulted, I think, <clears throat> in an, a completely new forms of social life and completely new forms of, of problems that we have not encountered yet. Yes. And I think in the future, we're going to face with male insecurity, that's going to be a big issue, yeah. particularly coupled with the upbringing that we have in our culture or the South European cultures, which, which actually don't bring up males or boys to be self-sufficient and independent in their lives. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's a kind of never-ending maternal or yeah. parental nurturing, nurturing, right? You never, for instance, in Italy, it's, 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 it, Italy is, uh, is a typical Mediterranean country where people leave their parental homes in their 40s as opposed to Scandinavia when they leave early, then they drop into poverty, then the welfare state pushes them up and so on and so forth. So, I mean, when we speak about these things, it's, I, I see an emergence of, of an elements of a completely new gender regime, particularly in, in the younger population and, and uh, 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 in these emotional or sexual dimensions of our lives, which are going to bring us a whole new set of questions that we as a society will need to answer. So let us think a bit differently. I'm not sure, but just let us think. So. More, more girls, the younger female generations, <coughs> how to say, you, you, had no talk. <coughs> so you said that they start being more emancipated and uh, acting, behaving similarly to their male generation, how to say participants, I don't know how to say it, but maybe we can think that we here we have the reversed coping with patriarchal metrics again. So in, in, the, in the old patriarchy they uh, had the roles learned by and transferred by, transmitted by their mothers and never mind. So uh, social, female social roles. Uh, but now they get more opportunities through education, emancipation, etc. But again, they do not uh, develop their autonomy as female, but copy male aggressive yes. behavior. So that's reversed patriarchal yes. matrix and in in the case of uh, uh, how you you said the crisis of masculinity again you we have the reversed patriarchal matrix we, we are not speak talking about autonomous personalities of one and another gender power struggle again power struggle. again power struggle and so i think that you helped me to clarify this to me at, at this moment. Thank you very much. Uh, also, I want to thank Professor Daniel to mention this also uh, new perspective on how this affects also male uh, in this, especially in their teenage years or younger ages, also through education. And I want to mention this funny anecdote a uh, couple, like a month ago, I was with my friends at the 
Um, and I don't think these insecurities are, will happen, and I think they are happening right now. Uh, for example, we were at the bar or ordering some cocktails, and uh, uh, my male friend, uh, he asked for some cocktail, I don't know, and he, um, the, he got this, like, woman's glass, and he was like, uh, uh, I don't want to, uh, he was very insecure, he was very uh, ashamed that he was drinking from this uh, espresso martini glass. So it was very obvious that also this affects not only uh, women, but also male uh, teenager students and like, uh, and also through this educational uh, system that uh, Larissa mentioned that also it starts from a really early age for example when you buy boy uh, to boys the soldiers I now remember that I also had this kind of toys and I now when I think about it there is none of the female soldiers in that uh, toy also to uh, give uh, uh, these kids a uh, chance to choose what they want to. For example, I have also a nephew. This is all personal examples, which I'm now aware of. Um, he's uh, passionate about drawing, and his mother is all constantly, you have to be sportsman, you have to be sportsman. Uh, your, um, your dad was a sportsman, your uh, granddad was a sportsman, and he is not really talented for uh, that kind of sports. He is more creative. He has this creative side. So it also affects uh, uh, and young boys, male, and so. Uh, I'm glad that Professor Daniel also mentioned that. So yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. It, uh, Mila wanted something on. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add one gender perspective, which I wasn't aware until recently. So in America, there are studies regarding benevol benevolent treatment in criminal courts uh, uh, by women. So when women are, in uh, are charged, they are usually not going to jail, and if they are going to jail, it's for the shorter period of time. And then uh, and at first, when I was reading these articles, I was like, okay, cool. it's really nice, so feminization has done some job here. And then, when I saw the explanation and the analysis of these results, is that women are, by the male judges in America especially, are seen as uh, mothers. So, male judge see a woman in front of him and thinks of a mother who, if uh, if it's in in cancer, in, is in prison. It's easier. If it's in prison, it's going to be away from uh, uh, its children, and uh, her children will not be able to uh, to have proper care. So, even if so, that phenomena, which at the first glance thinks uh, uh, looks as a good thing, are also the product of patriarchal metrics and mm -hmm. thinking of uh, male judges. So just just a short comment. So patriarchy can can sometimes be <laughs> pro 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 gender equality pro or gender. pro gender. Yeah. But also Professor Adrian being a phenomenal uh, critical race feminist who g gave the lecture within the logium and also wrote the article in our book series. She adds an intersectional. Uh, facts uh, of reality of the USA society that proportionally much more uh, women of color mm -hmm. uh, have been in jails. Yes. And it's also interesting, uh, they're usually charged for like drug abuse and they're charged really harshly because they're seen as bad mothers. Mm. So that's that intersection. Yeah, okay, yes, okay, yeah. So, uh, okay, yeah, uh, we are lack of time. So, uh, when I talk about the barriers of gender inequality, I would just single out them. We, we don't have to talk more there. Uh, I mean, I, I just wanted to talk more about the barriers to be part of the legal profession. So, um, uh, there is something so called implicit gender biases. There are a lot of stereotypes, um, uh, as we already mentioned, think leader, think male. Uh, there is something so called double bind. This 
this means that uh, women are being um, uh, evaluated according to the masculinity leadership uh, concept. This means that women are always too soft or too tough, but never just right. Um, <coughs> Women leaders face higher standards and lower rewards than men usually. They are perceived as competent, unlike, but rarely both. Uh, there is something so-called maternity leave, and this is also in other profession, but in, in legal especially. Um, uh, difficulties in balancing personal and professional life. I mean, Mila already mentioned, and we made a difference between judges and lawyers. Um, a lack of effective mentors and supportive networks. Professor Daniel already mentioned, because there are a lot of male supporting networks than, than uh, female. And uh, finally, women usually hitting the glass ceiling. So, uh, and there is something that is uh, uh, connected with a specific social context uh, this is the 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 the, the criteria uh, to uh, to be promoted and to be appointed as a judge and i would just like to finish with something nice that there is a good practice in ontario uh, uh -huh, yes yes okay thank you in canada uh, there is uh, like uh, because there are a lot of measures to promote gender equality there is also gender quotas there is also action plans there is uh, um, introducing more flexible working hours uh, differences in education and so on, but uh, what happened like in Ontario, uh, they established the impartial uh, and transparent uh, recruitment process of judges and they promoted and empowered women and this was happening uh, in the way like of 10 years and they made like uh, the, they increased the number of judges because they made the transparent and um, very clear criteria for promotion and for appointment of judges. So this is um, the proof that if you change the public policy and that you, if you're really oriented and if you empower, because they had a, like a, a very low number of women who appointed to being a judge because they, they didn't believe that they could be appointed. It was predominantly male profession. So this is something, this is a good practice that uh, is a good example and um, uh, it's a hope. So thank you everyone. Thank you for your attention and um, uh, thank you Professor Dagica. We are not the last course. I think on Monday is the last one. So yes, thank you. Valeria we will finish the work today uh, with this but let me repeat for those who were not in the morning here uh, the last uh, working day will be Monday but uh, uh, according to the revised agenda one and a half lecture uh, related to the business law course uh, will be held on Monday from 10.30 10.30 to 12. Then we have the uh, whole course as proposed. Uh, uh, Professor Lubinka Kovacevic will uh, call that labor law and gender equality course with different three interesting lectures. And then uh, something that is very important, I would ask all students from Belgrade who know due to the amount of attendance uh, which they, they, they can guess because we are making the list but that's the process that's not easy and we will finish that in time but just to ask all of those who were regularly more or less uh, attending uh, the spring school to come on Monday, please come because uh, um, the head of the OSCE mission to Serbia ambassador Jan Brat, who I don't know to pronounce uh, very well, he, he wants to, to deliver certificates. It will be after a uh, labor law course. It will be at quarter to four, if I'm not wrong. So please come. And that ceremonial part will be nicer if we all are together. And then we will have that catering again together. I think that we enjoyed all the time and that we really have become the community together with those online. Uh, it would, of course, be much better that all of us are here in class, but it was not possible. And this gave, uh, how to say, advantage that many people who, are, who have not been in Belgrade could attend. Anyway, those who are in Belgrade, please think, plan to attend even you can attend the labor law online, but come in person at, uh, for, for this ceremonial 
Thanks a lot. Thank you. See you on the next one.